The benefits of locking financial data and confidential information into blockchains are well known, but they're still at risk from cyber criminals who might exploit access through a valid operational process or gain entry via poor coding. So while blockchains may be unchangeable, they're still tempting targets for ingenious cyber criminals. To explore this issue, we're joined by Jeff Banman, founder and CEO of Block Agent, Vincent Lawrence, Group Chief Information Security Officers at Euroclear, Marta Gita Pikaska, Director of Ecosystem at Hyperledger, and Vila Sontu, Head of Emerging Technologies at Nordia Bank. Welcome all to Cybos TV. A large table full today. Good yeah. to see. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. That, that's how we like it. But Marta, let's start first with you. People talk about hacking. But is hacking blockchain different to traditional hacking? Well, that is an interesting question because um, a lot of time, actually, if you look at the attack vectors and what happens is there are very few attack vectors that are new to uh, blockchain. Um, I pulled up this uh, white paper that analyzes uh, blockchain security and different attack vectors and uh, the researchers clearly show that there are only two uh, blockchain specific hacks which is one is forking meaning you know you have a side chain or a new version of the blockchain and people start fighting which one is the real version of blockchain and uh, orphaning blocks so kind of slowing down the network making sure that some blocks do not uh, go on the network otherwise it's traditional uh, denial of service attacks uh, all sort of server security breaches and uh, privacy breaches all of that i mean we know that already. Mm. Uh, they are most standard uh, uh, attacks out there. Why are, why are public blockchains more attractive to attackers than private ones? Well, because public blockchains are about money and people love money. <laughs> I guess that's <laughs> the, the simple answer. There are more people on a public blockchain and while it brings higher security, because the more people, the more resilient the network, the more stable it is and so on, that also means that there is bigger attacks uh, field right we can uh, there are more sp uh, places where we could attack the blockchain plus as I, as i'm saying it's all about money cryptocurrencies and it is really beneficial to uh, get those in pr private blockchains they are tightly controlled um, participants know each other most of the time or at least have been pre-verified that they can participate they can be trusted quote unquote um, so there is less uh, it is less feasible to attack private blockchains because uh, malicious behavior can be very easily spotted. Mm. And, and Jeff, fascinatingly, a transfer agent can actually provide recalls for lost or stolen blockchain securities. I mean, how is that? Because the assumption is, is that they're gone forever. Yeah, this is something that's a very new, novel part of market structure in the US. And it really is part of the uh, customer protection regime that the SEC and FINRA, who are the two main regulators of the uh, securities markets, would like to see. So uh, for something to qualify as a blockchain-based digital security, um, th there's actually a feature built into the smart contract where uh, there's an ability, if, if you're uh, an investor and you, you believe that your, your private key is lost or there's been stolen or there's been an erroneous trade, you can actually, there's someone you can have recourse to so it's different from uh, an, an anonymous, permissionless network. In this case, there actually is uh, an entity, which is the, the transfer agent, uh, that you can go to to file, file your claim. Mm -hmm. And then um, through both, uh, it's, it's really a combination of uh, the technology is built this way, it's built into the smart contract when the instrument is issued. It needs to be built that way. If it's not built that way, you can't just retroactively make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, it's, it's built into the technology and it's also part of the customer protection regime of the securities regulated landscape. So the, the transfer agent's record, which is called the master security holder file, is actually the, the golden record. So the transfer agent is maintaining that record. It's comparing differences between that and the blockchain. But what it means is that if, you're, you know, if your 100 uh, coins seem to be gone, uh, there's actually something you can do you about can it. You can recover them, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, it's different from uh, your experience, what it might be with other crypto assets. Mm. 
Vila, banks have uh, traditionally a reputation to be quite risk averse when it comes to the adoption of new technologies. How does this mindset work when dealing with blockchain networks? Well, anybody who's ever worked with a bank or inside a bank will tell you the same thing. Everything happens slowly, everything happens, you know, takes a lot of time, uh, nothing seems to be moving at any point in time. Well, one of the nuances of that actually that people, especially working in the tech sector, uh, do miss that it, this is a feature of banks, not really a bug. And you know, nowhere you know, is this more clear than you know, when working with blockchains. So what we do is we, uh, we try to kind of dissect the, the concept of blockchain, forget about the existence of blockchain, and see what are the really the risks, uh, what are the governance models, uh, what are the liabilities of different parties in the network. And as Martha said, we work mostly in the private net or networking space where we also have to identify everybody who is part of these networks. So again, you know, working in a bank as, an, as a new technologist, you have to respect the process. I guess that's the, uh, the key, key uh, purpose of, uh, uh, of somebody like me working in new technologies in a bank. You respect the process, you respect the outcome, uh, and it takes a lot of patience, but it's uh, definitely <laughs> worth it. In oh, you've obviously got plenty of patience <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Vincent, let me, let me come to you. You've been very patient because you've been waiting, but look, many people see blockchain as a fully secured mechanism by default in inverted yes. commas. I mean, is that a myth or reality? And are there any true stories behind all the, the, the blockchain stories that we've heard, the hacking tales? As you already developed it with my co-speakers, blockchain is a validation mechanism. As and any validation mechanism, if you implement it in the wrong way, you can have vulnerabilities, and those vulnerabilities can be exploited. Recent research works really demonstrated that some people can gain access on the blockchain. As long as you manage to get more than 51% of the computation power, theoretically, you can reverse all the previous transactions and perform uh, financial hacking. That's the theory. Okay. On top of that, did we see real activities related to financial crime? Unfortunately, yes. Some hacking groups and state sponsor attack managed to hack some of the public blockchain recently. Is it just the beginning? We think so, but everybody in the community is working hard to protect the blockchain as much as they can. Marta, looking for solutions. Uh, what's missing from the space at the moment to make blockchains more secure? Huh. Oh God, so many <laughs> things. Um, well, I guess the thing that you have to look at is that most attacks, uh, as you mentioned, the 51% attack, all those are based on the peer-to-peer -peer network. It's the fact that we are having many participants that do interact, that are interacting with each other that can be taken down. And sure, if you do it just for one or two nodes, that's fine. If you do it for a bigger network, that is uh, more important. I think what is missing today, mostly from uh, the blockchain solutions rather than blockchain as a technology, because I strongly believe that blockchain as a technology is as secure as any other technology. Most attacks always happen through the implementation. It is, you know, it is not the, um, it is not the core bus on, uh, on a mobile phone that is being hacked. It is the app that you're using that abuses that vulnerability and goes down into it. It is the wallets that are being hacked where people are storing money, not the blockchain itself, right? So unless we come up with some completely new and crazy idea of how do we create that blockchain, it is a fairly secure system. So what we need to do is start focusing on implementations, looking at the bigger picture, what other attack vectors are there and how blockchain interacts with those places so that um, we can secure them. You know, we need to hire user experience or better user experience, uh, quality of experience, all those things that make people smarter and, uh, well, smarter in a way that they don't break the, their own privacy and security, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and Jeff, let, let's go back to this idea of transfer agents because part of the, well, the point of blockchain was to actually get rid of the intermediaries. So if that's the case, why do you still need transfer agents? Can't blockchain actually perform that function on its own? Right, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, Juliet. Um, so at BlockAgent, we're building the transfer agent of the future, and uh, you know, the blockchain does perform a lot of uh, the functions of record keeping, uh, smart contracts, and so on, but you need somebody or something to check the blockchain to make sure that it's performing as expected, uh, to make sure that the uh, smart contracts are doing what they're, they're meant to. Uh, there are also some functions that, uh, at least today, 
the smart contracts uh, can't do on their own. So associating wallets with identities mm -hmm. is, is a very important uh, part of uh, kind of, again, the customer protection, the AML KYC process. Uh, there's also the function I talked about before, where if you have a lost or stolen security, mm -hmm. uh, or you have, uh, there's been an erroneous trade, you, you, uh, you know, there's still a benefit from an investor protection mm -hmm. point of view to have somebody you can turn to. Yeah, to recover it. Yeah, and, and so, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it, as a transfer agent, as a truly 21st century digital transfer agent, you know, we can leverage a lot of the benefits and the efficiencies. And I, I think of it as sort of a light, a light level or light layer of intermediary or light, uh, a light layer of centralization that promotes greater decentralization and makes the overall system work. Mm -hmm. Bill, as a member of the We.Trade blockchain um, network, Nordia has been offering new kinds of digital trade finance services for its SME customers for, for over a year now. What have you learned so far, and has, has anything surprised you along the way? I guess, I mean, going into the WeTrade consortium, you know, back in 2017, we, we thought that we're going we're gonna to launch an innovative new digital trade service for SME customers, which we then did uh, in, in summer of 2018. And uh, now, with over a year of experience of our customers actually trading on the platform, we're seeing some surprising behaviors, I would say. Uh, number one, and it pains me to say this as an engineer, uh, our customers do not care that it's a blockchain. Uh, <laughs> they, only think, they only think they care about that they can trust uh, the process, trust the fact that they can uh, execute a digital trade uh, in the system. So, kind of coming back to my previous point about you know, us kind of doing all the checks and balances for all these kind of systems, our customers rely on us to do that. And you know, because of that, we have the trust in the market uh, from our customers to actually be protecting those processes. Now, in the background, of course, you know, the blockchain uh, architecture uh, using hyperledger fabric uh, does make things more secure and easier for us in the controlled environment that is WeTrade. So yeah, I think, you know, Coming to the question, the, uh, the most surprising thing really has been that our customers don't care about the technology, they see the value of the network, and they're using it in very interesting ways uh, that we didn't really always Don't foresee. get too upset about that, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's any technology, really, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> People are not asking, are you using machine learning? Are you using inter artificial intelligence? No, Google just works. Yeah, and we're and happy that it works. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, in a safe manner. <laughs> and, and, and Vincent, I mean, let's take a look at Euroclear because it's got a central and transversal position in the ecosystem yes, and you also started some blockchain initiatives, but did you apprehend blockchain security in a way that's a bit more different than usual to get there? I think it would be a tremendous error to consider blockchain as a brand new technology that would need specific security protocols or security features. If you want to make it as secure as you want, you need to apply the good old security basics from the right governance to the right technical controls and to the right implementation. And we insisted a lot on having the implementation right. If you are not right since day one, if you don't integrate security control since the beginning, if you don't do this secure by design, you will end up with vulnerabilities that can be easily exploited. The good news is blockchain is part some of an open world because you have publicly available blockchains. Based on this, a true community of security researchers are participating and make, uh, they are making our life easy by providing some new ideas of controls that we test, that we implement, such as the good old principle of security in depth. And right now it's working well. Jeff, you were involved in, uh, you're in charge, I should say, um, in some of the earliest blockchain work at CFTC and led the launch of Lab CFTC. Uh, what are you seeing from regulators now in their approach to blockchain and, and how are they dealing with the blockchain security issues? Right, so, so regulators, uh, I think, get a, get a, get a bad rap uh, sometimes. Regulators have been very engaged and proactive about trying to understand blockchain and its different capabilities uh, you know, the, uh, differentiating between you know public and private, permissioned and permissionless, uh, and ha have really um, lab, lab CFTC was one example, but there are many examples around the world of regulators who who not only have engaged with the industry and technology, but have uh, participated actively in experiments to understand how how it works. Um, you know, I think that regulators understandably uh, have concerns. For example. Um, if uh, you know an, an open, permissionless system were to be used for systemically important market infrastructure, uh, you know, wearing my former regulator hat when I was uh, responsible for supervising uh, systemically important market infrastructure, the idea that you would have kind of a smart contract without a kill switch and without, 
you know, this, this sort of unstoppable, immutable code running something critical, you know, that was a little bit terrifying. <laughs> um, Tell me about it. <laughs> um, but you know that, that uh, you know blockchains come in a lot of different shapes and shapes and sizes. Uh, crypto assets, virtual assets come in a lot of shapes and sizes. And I've I've been really impressed with the the willingness of um, regulators to kind of get into the the details and the nooks and crannies. Uh, typically, they're balancing different missions. You know, capital formation, investor protection. Um, in the space in which block agent operates, which is the regulated securities markets. Uh, you, know, if, you know, our main regulators are the SEC and then FINRA also looks at those markets. And they've been, I think, very open-minded and, and really, you know, trying to understand how is the technology going to work, what are the procedures going to be, you know, does, and, and asking, you know, does this offer advantages that current technologies don't, while also, um, you know, maintaining uh, protection of customer protection and market integrity and other things. Mm. And let, let me go to you now, Villa, because what, what, in your opinion, should the role of the bank be in addressing the new security challenges in, in blockchain-based solutions yeah. as an engineer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh, I mean, you have to understand the role of banks as the maintainers of the existing financial infrastructure and ecosystem. Uh, and while we are maintaining the way the financial systems work today, we also need to look at into the future and how do we actually use technologies like blockchain while keeping it secure and understandable for our customers. So I would argue that the banks are bringing uh, trust and stability into the blockchain market uh, in a completely different way. So while we are might be perceived as slow, as I said in the beginning, uh, once we complete all the necessary security processes, the due diligence and the risk management that we do, you can be fairly secure that if something launches into production, it is safe and secure and trustworthy for our customers. Now, we as Nordea, we've done now this twice, so we have two networks using blockchain technology in production. So we trade, and then we have a digital uh, real estate trading network in Finland that went live just a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, we are, we are learning a lot, and we're, we're sure that you know, these are bringing value to our customers, uh, and that is uh, ultimately our role always, to serve our customers. Vincent, a, a key success factor to cybersecurity is, of course, information sharing. But it seems that the hype around blockchain is actually going down. Do you, do you still have people out there doing R&D on blockchain security? And, and do we see a real push from the community at the moment? So in fact, you're asking two very good questions. So let's first talk about what we are saying in terms of R&D. Even if the hype is quite slow, I would say, from a blockchain security R&D perspective right now, we're seeing some very good research papers out there. I'm thinking about the latest work from the MIT, for example, that was of a tremendous quality. And some also uh, researcher part of the community are issuing several white papers on a monthly basis. Now coming back on the information sharing. Cybersecurity is not a competitive landscape, even between different competitors in the financial sector. And I think as long as we will be able to exchange on, on vulnerabilities related to blockchain, uh, as long as we'll be able to exchange also on process and what we did to secure blockchains, it's going to be a win-win for everybody and for the entire community. Well, I think we've had a win-win because we've been beautifully informed on the subject of blockchain. I'm very sorry that you're disappointed as an engineer, but speaking of <laughs> customer, I do appreciate the work that you're doing. But guys, thank you so much to Jeff Bandman, Vincent Lawrence, Marta Gita Piekaska, and of course, Ville Santu. Thank you so much for joining us here on Cyboss TV and have a great Cyboss week. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <laughs>